Hello everybody, welcome back to Weekly Wild Wisdom. As always, I am your host, Zero Yeti, and happy Dinosaur Day. That's right, it is May 15th, 2021, which means it's one of the two days you can celebrate International Dinosaur Day, because International Dinosaur Day is a biannual celebration occurring on the 15th of May and the 1st of June. And in honor of Dinosaur Day, this week's this entire week's roster of animals is going to be dinosaur specifically from the Morrison Formation of Western North America. Why the Morrison Formation? Because I live in an area that's considered the Morrison Formation, and I want to do some local dinosaurs. Starting off the list, we have Torvosaurus, which is a genus of carnivorous megalosaurid theropod dinosaur that lived approximately 165 to 148 million years ago during the middle to late Jurassic period. In what is now Colorado, Portugal, Germany, possibly England, Montana, Mexico, Canada, several other states in the United States, Tanzania, and Uruguay. Uruguay. The first discovered remains referred, referable to Torvosaurus were discovered in 1899 by Elmer Riggs in the freeze-out hills of southeastern Wyoming, 11 miles northwest of Medicine Bow. The material consisted of part of a left foot and right hand, and were, they were taken to the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, they were then stored there until, the, until being rediscovered around 2010. The specimen was a, the first specimen assigned to Torvosaurus uh, was first assigned to Torvosaurus tannery after being described in 2014. More remains of large theropod and what is now believed to have been Torosaurus were discovered in the Tenganuru beds formation in Tanzania, uh, which is one of Africa's most prolific fossil formations from the di from the Mesozoic period. Uh, these were once named Megalosaurus ingus by Werner Justnitz in 1920. However, the name Torvosaurus didn't really appear until the type specimen, which was found in the Dry Mesa Quarry, Colorado, in 1972. Uh, these remains were later named and described in 1979 as Torvosaurus tenere by Peter Malcolm Glatton and James Alvin Jensen. As of 2021, two species are known, Torvosaurus tenere and Torvosaurus gurney. At 33 feet in length and 5 tons in weight, the very robust Torvosaurus is not only the largest megalosaurid known to have existed, but is considered to be one of the largest predators of the Jurassic period. Because it shared its environment with other large carnivores such as Allosaurus and Ceratosaurus, it is thought that the, th that the three may have coexisted by having different dietary preferences, with Torvosaurus acting as a super scavenger, scaring off other predators from their kills and primarily eating the bones of other animals. Additionally, Torvosaurus, with its big skull, strong bite pressure, and large, powerful body, may have been specialized in opening up and dismembering large sauropod carcasses, which would have allowed smaller theropods like Allosaurus better access. In a possible commensalism relationship, similar to how like vultures and jackals work today, uh, next up, we have Camarasaurus, which is a genus of quadrupedal herbivorous sauropod dinosaur that lived throughout the Morrison Formation in North America throughout the Jurassic period from some 155 to 145 million years ago. With an average size of 60 feet in length, 31 tons in weight, although a few 75 foot long and 50 ton individuals have been found, they are relatively smaller than other notable titanic sauropods with which they shared their environment, such as Diplodocus, Apatosaurus, Barosaurus, and Brachiosaurus. However, they were much more numerous, with Camarasaurus being by far the most common uncovered dinosaur throughout the Morrison Formation. All three species of Camarasaurus, those being Camarasaurus supremus, Camarasaurus brandius, and Camarasaurus litus, can be distinguished from other sauropods by their shorter neck and tail, generally more boxy torso and square body proportions and in particular they're very they're rather large for well for a sauropod rather square shaped skulls with sported chisel shaped teeth this dentition shows that camarasaurus almost certainly ate coarser material uh, coarser more woody plant material 
than the fragile tooth Diplodocus. The first record, record of Chimerosaurus comes from 1877 when a few scattered vertebrae were located in Colorado by Ormel W. Lucas pursuing and then pursuing his long running and acrimonious competition known as the Bone Wars with Othniel Charles Marsh, the pa famous paleontologist Edward Drinker Cope paid for these bones and moving quickly, later named and described them the same year. For his part, Marsh later named some of the sauropod findings Morosaurus grandius, but most paleontologists today consider that to be a species of Camarasaurus. Due to its relatively smaller size, more woody diet, and sheer abundance, it is believed that Camarasaurus was a high browser that preferred more forested environments traveling in herds across the landscape in search of patches of woodland on which to feed. Next up is Stegosaurus. It is a genus of herbivorous three or four and dinosaur which lived during the late Jurassic period from between 155 to 144 million years ago in what is now what the Western United States but has also been found in Portugal. It was originally named by Orthoneal Charles Marsh in 1877 from remains uncovered north of Morrison, Colorado. These first bones became the holotype specimen of the species Stegosaurus cyclatus. Marsh initially believed that the remains were from an aquatic turtle-like animal and the basis for its scientific name, roofed lizard, was due to his early belief that the plates laid flat on the animal's back, overlapping like shingles on a roof. We now know that rather than acting as an armor plating, the knife like, the, well, the kite-like plates instead formed a distinct double row of rising vertically along the back. Additionally, Theagosaurus had two pairs of long spines extending horizontally near the end of the tail that formed what is known as a thagomizer, which is a term coined by far side comic artist Gary Larson. It was used as a distinctive it used this distinctive thagomizer to defend itself from predators such as Allosaurus, which we know about because we have several Allosaurus specimens with puncture holes from thagomizer wounds. Although it is uncertain what purposes the plates served, blood vessels within the plate suggest they could be used for both temperature regulation and as display structures. There are cur currently three species of Stegosaurus recognized, including Stegosaurus sophatus, Stegosaurus ungulatus, and Stegosaurus stenops. Up to 30 feet in length and over 7, ton ton 7 tons in weight. Stegosaurus was the largest of the Stegosaurus dinosaurs. However, it was dwarfed by its contemporaries, such as the giant sauropods, Brachiosaurus, Apatosaurus, Chimerosaurus, Diplodocus, Barosaurus, Brontosaurus, the list goes on. Uh, because of such competition, it is thought Stegosaurus evolved to be a low browser, uh, feeding on mosses, ferns, horsetails, cycads, and it, overall it occupied a similar niche to modern day rhinos or wood buffalo. Next up is Ornitholestes, which is a species of small theropod dinosaur native to the Morrison Formation of the United States throughout the late Jurassic period, roughly 154 million years ago. The whole type skeleton was excavated in July 1900 in the Bone Cabin Quarry in Wyoming by an American Museum of Natural History Expedition led by Peter C. Kaysen, Paul Miller, and Frederick Br Brewster Loomis, with it being the latter who named and described it, by, with it being later named and described by Henry Fairfield Osborne in 1903. It represents a partial skeleton with a skull, including numerous elements of the vertebrae column, the forelimbs and pelvis, and hind legs. One of the smallest carnivorous dinosaurs of the Morrison, Ornitholestes weighed just 30 pounds and measured 6.5 feet in length, with its long whip-like tail comprising around half the body length. Its head was small but heavily built, with long conical teeth and large eye sockets which occupied up to 25% of the overall skull space. Notably, there is an area of broken bone near the external naris, or the nostril, uh, which appears to bulge upward. This led many to believe for a long time that Ornitholestes sported a nasal-like horn similar to other theropods such as Proceratosaurus and Ceratosaurus. However, it is now believed that the upward flare was caused by post-mortem crushing of the skull.
Perhaps the most distinctive feature of Ornith Celestis was its incredibly large uh, and long forelimbs, which sported remark a remarkable range of motion, especially when compared to other dinosaurs of its time. Due to this flexibility, as well as Ornith Celestis' stout skull and large eyes, it is thought that this dinosaur acted as primarily a nocturnal semi arboreal predator, not unlike a tiger quoll or a clouded leopard. Ornith Lestes would have prowled the twilight forest of ancient North America, hunting lizards, amphibians, early mammals, small pterosaurs, young dinosaurs, and even primitive birds. Next up is Dryosaurus, which is a genus of herbivorous ornithopod dinosaur, which lived during the late Jurassic period from between 156 to 140 million years ago. In what is now the western United States, Spain, Portugal, England, and Tanzania, uh, it was first described in 1878 by Professor Orthneal Charles Marsh, who initially considered it to be a new species of Lasiosaurus. However, he would later reclassify it to its own distinct genus. In addition to the horned beak, the Dryosaurus sported a densely packed molars and cheek pouches to prevent loss of food while chewing, making it fairly efficient for its time. And standing between four and six feet tall at the shoulder and measuring up to 14 feet in length and around 200 pounds in weight, this dinosaur had a long, slender, yet strong legs and a stiffened tail, that which allowed it to run prolonged distances and at considerable speed, not unlike a modern ostrich. Dryosaurus's skull also had large orbital sockets near and near all-round vision, indicating it had very good eyesight. Additionally, this early iguanodont is notable for being one of the first dinosaurs to have its growth extensively studied, as in 1972, Roddy D. Sheets and his family discovered a rich fossil site containing eight dryosaurs uh, in a variety of growth stages, ranging from young adult to embryos still contained within eggs. As one of the smaller and more numerous dinosaurs found throughout the Morrison and the Tinganura Bay formations, it is thought that Dryosaurus would have occupied a similar niche to that of modern gazelles or kangaroos, that being herding small herbivores that rely on their surprising speed and agility to escape predators. Next up, at number six, we have Brachiosaurus, one of my personal favorite dinosaurs. It was a species of sauropod dinosaur that lived in North America during the late Jurassic, about 155 to 144 million years ago. It was first described by American paleontologist Elmer S. Riggs in 1903 from fossils found in the Colorado River Valley of, West, of western Colorado, United States. Riggs named the dinosaur Brachiosaurus altorothorax, uh, which means arm lizard, in reference to its proportionally long forelimbs. Standing at over 45 feet tall, 65 feet long, and weighing upwards of 50 tons, Brachiosaurus was considered to be the largest dinosaur uh, known at the time of its discovery, and it was only later being would only later be dethroned by South American titanosaurs like Argentinosaurus and Dreadnoughtus. Because of its massive size and the placement of the nostrils at the top of the head, Brachiosaurus, like other sauropods, was erroneously believed to have been an aquatic animal. However, Brachiosaurus is notable. Uh, for being one of the first sauropods proved to have lived on land when Elmer S. Riggs and John Bell Hatcher pointed out that its hollow vertebrae had no analog in living aquatic or semi-aquatic animals, and its long limbs and compact feet indicated specialization for terrestrial locomotion. Like other sauropods, Brachiosaurus had disproportionately long neck, small skull, and large overall size. Atypically, however, Brachiosaurus had longer forelimbs than hind limbs, which resulted in a steeply inclined trunk and proportionally shorter tail. This, would, this more giraffe-like build would have allowed Brachiosaurus to easily reach and feed upon the treetops, thus avoiding competition with other sauropods, which were built lower to the ground. Uh, in life, Brachiosaurus would have lived in small herds of between 5 and 20 individuals, traveling across the landscape between groves of ginkgos, conifers, and cycads, consuming upwards of 800 pounds of woody plants per day in order to support its massive size. And last up, we have one of the most famous dinosaurs of the Morrison, and one of the most numerous, 
Allosaurus. Allosaurus is a genus of carnivore and theropod dinosaurs that lived 156 to 143 million years ago during the late Jurassic period in what is now North America, Portugal, and Tanzania. Allosaurus sports a rather complex name and history, with the first remains uh, being uncovered by Ferdinand Van Nevere Hayden in 1869, uh, who believed it to belong to the genus Polycheopleuron. Hayden then sent the fragmentary specimen to be better examined by one Joseph Levy, who decided it deserved its own genus, that being Antrodemus. The name Allosaurus itself comes from an 1877 specimen described by Orthneal Charles Marsh. The multiplicity of the earlier names complicated latter research, and even at the time, authors such as Samuel Wendell Will Willingston often complained there were too many names being coined. Uh, this all came to a head in 1920 when Charles W. Gilmore attempted to organize the hot mess that was dinosaur taxonomy in the early 1900s. In doing so, Gilmore came to the conclusion that the tail vertebrae of Entriodemus by Leedy was indistinguishable from those of Allosaurus. And Entriodemus thus should be the preferred name because, as the older name, it had priority. Entriodemus thus became the accepted name of the, for this familiar genus for around 50 years, until James Madsen published the Cleveland Lloyd specimens that included uh, and concluded that Allosaurus should be used because Antriodemus was based on incredibly fragmentary and poorly preserved remains. In life, Allosaurus measured an average of 28 feet in length, 2,200 pounds in weight, and stood around 12 feet tall. Uh, its body was agile and sleek, allowing it to reach speeds up to 25 miles per hour. Uh, it also had rather long and robust arms, sporting large hand claws. Allosaurus' skull structure is unique uh, for being fairly elongated, but, had, but being rather narrow and sporting a distinct pair of horns over, the so over its eyes. In particular, its jaws were fairly thin and weak compared to its contemporaries. However, it was able to open its mouth incredibly wide. Because of this and its robust neck, uh, well, the, because of its jaw range of opening and its robust neck, it is believed that instead of relying on bite force, Allosaurus would instead swing its open mouth in a downward motion, not unlike an axe, allowing its saw-like teeth to shear off chunks of flesh from its victims. Allosaurus was the most common large carnivore in its environment, accounting for upwards of 70% of theropod specimens found throughout its fossil localities. Uh, because of its relative abundance and the fact that a majority of Allosaur specimens are found within close proximity to one another, it is believed that Allosaurus lived in or at least hunted in packs. There is dramatic evidence for Allosaur attacks on Stegosaurus, including Allosaurus tail vertebrae with a particularly healed puncture wound in its pelvis that fits a Stegosaurus tail spike and a stegosaurus plate, neck plate with a U-shaped wound bitten out of it that correlates well with an allosaurus's jaws. However, the most popular prey for allosaurus consists of the plethora of sauropod species it coexisted with. In order to tackle such titanic prey, a group of allosaurus would have, had, would have worked together to isolate an individual from the rest of the herd and then repeatedly jumped onto the herd before using their large arms to grip onto the prey and hold on while delivering repeated hatchet-like bites to severely weaken the animal until it came to its wounds. As always, take care to my guys, gals, my binary pals, and happy dinosaur day.